said that baseball was your life. Can we just sit and talk about baseball? Uh, sure, if okay. you don't mind uh, coming with me while I get out of this, uh, this suit. Come on, walk me to the lobby. Here's your bat, Mr. Ruth. Oh, babe, uh, you grew up on these streets. It looks like a sort of a rough neighborhood. Yeah, well, it uh, hasn't changed much, I guess. Uh, well, it was a rough neighborhood when I was a kid. That was around 1900, 1902, when I was about seven years old. And uh, Well, your folks were pretty busy, weren't they, at that time? Well, you see, that, that's part of it, because my mom and dad, mother and father, had a had a tavern or a bar, you call it, and they had a couple of them. They would move from one to the other, and uh, they lived above it. And living above it, why, they'd work from maybe 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning and right till 2 or 3 the next morning, you know? And... Uh, Maybe all week long, if they worked like that, they'd clear $15. So they didn't have that much time to supervise what I was getting into, and I was a little wild. Like. But you had some other family difficulties, too, other than no supervision, didn't you? Well, uh, most people don't realize... Uh, sit down, uh, kid, uh, right there. Most people don't realize it, but uh, I was the firstborn. I was the oldest. Uh, there were eight of us all told. But the sad part about it was that Six of us died uh, while we were still kids. And, uh, I, I don't say that's uh, an excuse for being a, uh, acting like a tough kid. It makes you a survivor, though, doesn't it? Well, you have to survive one way or the other. And, uh, but, uh, well, this is where it all started. This is your house? This is the you house where I was born. Would like you mind? In? No, sure. Babe, uh, grandmother's house, but it's not too bad. You well, didn't spend much time indoors, huh? I didn't spend much time any place when I was a kid. We moved around a lot, you know, mm -hmm. and, then, and I moved around a lot. I wasn't out playing on the streets while I was some other place. Didn't spend as much time in school as I should have. But as I said, it was pretty difficult, you know, to be supervised the way we should have. And you found some, though, when you made the move to St. Mary's, didn't you? Yeah, well, I was sort of... Uh, put there. I don't remember eating too many meals at this table, I'll tell you that, kid. But uh, St. Mary's was more like home to me. Well, babe, uh, St. Mary's wasn't exactly a prep school, was it? <laughs> no, I guess most people don't know. But St. Mary's was what they called an industrial school. Now, an industrial school at that time uh, was a kind of a place where a kid would go if he didn't have a home or his parents were broken up or his parents were dead or he was uh, incorrigible. And there was a, a law in, in, uh, in Maryland at the time when a child was what they called incorrigible it couldn't be handled why he could be put into one of these schools. Well, my parents put me in there voluntarily because they felt I could get better supervision than they could give me at the time, and they were just too busy and just too harried to do the job right. Tell me about Brother Matthias and the job he did on you at, at the home. Well, he was like a father to me. In fact, he was probably more of a father to me than my own father's because I spent so much time at St. Mary's. Big man. Six foot six, 250 pounds. He was the, what they called the prefect of discipline at St. Mary's, and uh, he could take a fungal, you know, baseball, you know, and hit the fungos out of the bat, and he'd hit him out of that outfield with one hand. Yeah, he taught me most, uh, or most of the things, you know, catching and so on, you know what? Like, oh, yeah, I was started as a catcher. You're kidding. Oh, yeah. Well, they didn't have a left-handed mitt, so I had to use the right-handed mitt, you know, catch with your left hand. And what I would do when that ball would come in, I'd throw up the ball, drop the glove, catch it before it hit, and then just take it to second, first, wherever I had to throw it. You were really dynamite, weren't you? Well, well, I wasn't too bad, but they played a lot of baseball there. They had about, oh, maybe 41, 42 teams, and that was pretty important for kids. Uh, now, baseball was a pretty important game at that time, still is, but, I mean, compared to other sports, so most kids played it. And it's a kind of game you can play without much equipment. And all you need is a bat and a ball and some gloves, and all the kids can play, and I think that's important. I think all kids should be able to play a sport. One time there, I, uh, I thought maybe I'd become a priest. You, Babe Ruth, become well, a Well, you know, I think any kid that goes to a Catholic school boy, sometime or other, the thought crosses his mind that maybe he'd want to be a priest. But Brother Matthias, he counseled me there, and uh, he knew I wasn't going to be a priest. You know? I was a ball player. <laughs> something I want to 
show. Now, this is the bar, kid, where my dad stood. He owned this bar when I was about seven years. We used to live right up, right above the bar all the time. Your dad stood right there? Stood right there and served the drinks. And, you know, I think about that, and seven-year-old kid like me, uh, running around a place like this, I gotta pick up something, I guess, and, you know, kids ought to stay out of bars like this. Your dad was even, I think, killed trying to break up a fight outside here on the street, huh? See, lots of things can happen, you know. Well, a lot of things did happen. Jack Dunn took you right out of here, right out of Baltimore, and put you in baseball uniform. For the Orioles, International League. I remember the first year I went down to spring train at Fayetteville, North Carolina. I was about 19, and uh, I was a big boy, about 6'2", 185, 190, and uh, all the other players were sort of small that time, you know, 5'9", 5'10", 168, 70. Well, they called me Jack Dunn's baby. Imagine that. Yeah. That's how you got the name? That's how I got the name Babe. Babe Ruth. We'll never forget it. How about Boston and the Yankees? The well, that comes later. You want to talk about I'd that? I'd love to. Well, let's go someplace where I'm more at ease. <laughs> okay, baby. Oh, hi, babe. You feel a little more comfortable now, huh? Yeah. Well, I suppose, Tom, uh, you spend as many years in baseball as I do, I, you feel more at home on a baseball diamond. Now, you were sold from the Orioles. Uh, Jack Dunn sold you off to the Boston Red Sox. Yeah. Eh? Yeah, that was 1914. Uh, I played about a half season for the Orioles. And, uh, so he sold me to the Red Sox as a pitcher. And uh, for, oh, I guess there were three of us who went up, about $20,000 for the three of us. And, uh, I guess most people don't realize that I was a pitcher. and uh, A good pitcher. Oh, good. <laughs> my my uh, first season up there, well, the second season, really, 1916, I won 23 games. I had nine shutouts, and I earned the, had the, uh, led the league in the earned run average. You had a couple of other things happen to you. How did you get from the mound to the outfield? Uh, did you do it at baseball? Well, I was with Boston then, and... Uh, Ed Barrow was the manager, and I was hitting him pretty good. Uh, but you see, when you pitch, you could only hit the game that you pitch in, so I'd rest every couple of days. And I guess the people were coming to, to see Babe Ruth hit him out of the ballpark. So, <laughs> so then he played me in right field when I wasn't pitching. So uh, that was just too much. One day I got the flu, and I got pretty sick. And I said, look, Ed, I just can't do both. It's got to be one or the other. So I said, OK. They tried me at first base, and then they put me out in the field. And I said, you know, it's lonely out there. <laughs> he said, but lonely or not, we're going to stay there. And I did, and that's how I became a fielder, and uh, of course, I hit most of my long balls then. A lot of long balls. Now, Colonel Rupert with the Yankees must have liked you in the outfield. He got on with it right away with Mr. Frazee, didn't he? Well, I wanted uh, 20000 a year from uh, Harry Frazee, of course, who was the owner of the Red Sox. Some sort of a character, too, as a Broadway producer of sorts. And I think he <laughs> sold all of us ball players just to get enough money to put on his show. <laughs> but, but he wasn't about to uh, pay me 20000 a year, so he sold me to Rupert. And uh, that was some deal. They sold me for $100,000, and uh, Rupert uh, had to give him a line of credit of $300,000. So the whole deal is about $400,000. I, uh, I signed a contract that amounted to about $41,000 for the two years, and 20 and 21. Well, New York City, Gotham City, that's really where you belong, babe, right? I love New York, yeah, yeah. How about, how about playing there? How about the, the 60 home runs we all know about? But, well, I had a lot of good years now. My first year there was 1920, and uh, I batted 376 and 54 home runs. I had, uh, oh, uh, nine triples, was it? Uh, 36 doubles and stole 14 bases. It's Hold it a minute. 14, but you stole 14 bases? Oh, sure, yeah. I was never know pretty fast were... for a fat old man, <laughs> but I was younger then. We all know about the 60 home runs. The greatest Yankee team, was it the 27 team? 27 team, in my opinion. We had some, it was a team. That's what counted, you know. We had Musel and uh, Herb Pennock and Joe Dugan and uh, uh, Lou Gehrig, uh, some great ball players. And we were all, you know, happy to be part of that championship season. 
They bypassed too quickly over 60 home runs in 154 games, a record that most of us still feel stands. Yeah, well, I had other records. That was in 27, but uh, in 26, I had 57 home runs. And uh, in 20, as I said before, I had 54. And in 1919, when I was with Boston Red Sox, why, well, I had 29. Now, I broke a record of 27 that stood since 1884. <laughs> what about the ball? Was there a lively ball that they made for you? 1920, they they changed the yarn in the ball. They got Australian yarn that made it a little livelier. Then in 1926, they changed the center, put a cork center in it that made it a little more balanced. That was the year I hit 57 of them, you see. Now, you were making about $80,000. $80,000 a year, 30, 31. Two years then, huh? That's right. Now, the president, if my memory doesn't fail me, only made 75000 those days. But I had a better year than he did. <laughs> <laughs> what about the great batting stroke of Babe Ruth? Your lifetime average is, what, somewhere around 340 or 41? Uh, 342. Lifetime? Lifetime, that's right. All right, do you have a special swing? Do you have anything special? Well, uh, let me tell you, I just get up there and swing, but I really, the secret was back when I was with Boston, the first year I went up there, Shoeless Joe Jackson was playing for the Cleveland Indians, they came into Boston to play, and I played against him, and he really hit a long ball out there. And after the game, I remember getting dressed, running to that locker room, catching him when he's coming outside, and say, uh, Joe, would you just mind showing me how you grip that bat? And he showed me, and I said, thanks a lot, kid, and I left it. And that's when I started really hitting. Will, will you show us that grip? Sure, sure. It's a big piece of lumber, isn't it? it sure is. Oh. Well, let me show you the, All right. the, uh, how I hold this. Um, now, of course, if you're, you're a right-hander, I suppose. I suppose, yes. Yeah, well, uh, you'd have to reverse the procedure, because I'm left. So I usually grab it down by the end. Hey, hold on a minute. There's some kids. You want to show these kids that the Babe Ruth? Well, maybe they'd ball? like to know. Yeah. I think hey, they're... kids, come here. Like me to show you how I, uh, I grip my baseball bat here? Okay. See, now, I am a southpaw, which means, of course, I'm bat left hand. Now, when I hit all those 60 home runs in 1927, I grabbed that bat, see, down at the end, my little finger curled around the bottom on top. Then my left hand right underneath, you see, on the bottom, and held it tight. And, of course, then when I would swing, what you do is you throw your weight into it and you break your wrist and hit straight through and follow through. Okay, here, now you try that. Give, uh, give that a try, see? Babe, tell them a story about uh, the time in Chicago where you had the shot and you called it. Well, that was a 32 World Series. Yeah. And while we were playing in Chicago, uh, we had taken two games from them in New York, and uh, this was the uh, third game out in Chicago, Wrigley Field. And there were a lot of bench jockeying going on. You know what that is, ribbon, you know, everybody ribbing each other. Well, uh, first time up, I hit the uh, three-run homer. Second time up, I flied out to deep center. And this was the top of the fifth and was tied up 4-4. Four -four. And uh, I came up, and I was really ribbed by, by Chicago's Bush, a fellow named Bush over there. He said, if I had a, a belly like that, he hitched me to a wagon, <laughs> just like a horse, you know. <laughs> well, I get up there, and uh, first pitch was a strike, and I put my finger up and said one. Then the next two pitches were balls. Then the fourth pitch was another strike, I said two. And then I pointed out to center field, as if that's where that ball's going to go. And the next pitch, I just lined straight up, right over the fence, longest ball ever hit in Wrigley Field. And you just sort of went into that little jog, and that was Oh, it. yeah, I just said to myself, running around the bases, boy, you lucky bum. <laughs> I could have missed that so easy, you know. <laughs> what do you think we ought to do? Well, I don't know. I got a Packard out there. If you're interested in taking a ride in car, how about a little golf? I don't play well, but I'll do well, it. Well, I'll teach better. you all I know. How about that? <laughs> Come on, kids. Come on, kids. Babe, you really liked the big cars, didn't you? Oh, like classic sure do, sure do, yeah. Any other idiosyncrasies about you that we don't know about? We know oh. you like cigars and... Yeah, we all have some. I mean, did you have any? You're a ball player. I yeah. was scared, usually, before that <laughs> star Star Spangled Banner, you get that little flutter. Well, I had some, like, uh, coming in from right field. I always managed to touch second base. I always felt it was good luck. Couldn't stand butterflies, particularly the white ones, you know, out there in the field flying around. <laughs> and, uh... Of course, sometimes I'd drive to the ballpark, and on the way, if I happened to see um, an empty barrel, that meant that uh, I was going to win the, win the ball game. An day. empty barrel, right? Empty barrel, that's right. And I used to take a head of cabbage sometime to the ballpark, not to eat, though. 
I just peel off a leaf and uh, put it under my cap there, and it keeps the heat off my head, you see. We're almost to the golf club. You know, I'm not going to take it easy on you. Well, don't later. you. Don't you take it easy on me. You have to watch yourself. <laughs> Look out for the babe, kid. <laughs> Actually, though, the home run ball that you brought into baseball sort of changed the style, didn't it? Well, I was lucky, I guess. You know, baseball had a bad time there in 1919 with that scandal in Chicago, the White Sox. And I was with Boston, and I was hitting a long ball, and, uh, well, the crowd sort of liked it. I was just lucky. I became a hero. A bona fide American hero. <laughs> now, the heroes of your day, uh, Jack Dempsey, Tilden, a fellow named Bobby Jones. Speaking of Jones, am I up or... Mr. Ruth, I'm two down. Yes, sir, it's your honor. Yes, me. Right on the stick, babe. Babe, you're on the green. <laughs> well, you're in pretty good uh, shape yourself, kid. Great on. Well, speaking about shape, when you start hitting the four baggers, Inside baseball changed. The game itself changed. Well, up until 1920, it was called inside baseball. Now, you know what that is. You bunt to first, steal second, sacrifice to third, and score on a fly ball to the outfield, and you win the game one to nothing. Uh, John McGraw of the Giants, he was the prince of inside baseball. He did that for all those years. But when I came along and hit those 54 home runs in 1920 at Boston, why, well, sort of changed the game. Everybody started slugging is why don't you go ahead and hit. Look out for that water, though. It's only about 12 feet away. I'm glad you mentioned that, babe. Pretty good shot, babe, but you're going to one-putt me anyway. Day. Go ahead, kid. You're away. So what's new, babe? Tap that one in, okay? You know, those ropes you're smoking, you smoke a lot. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, Tom. See, when I was a kid, about seven, I started smoking. And I really shouldn't have, because smoking cigars and pipes all those years, I just can't seem to break the habit. They'll probably kill me someday. Uh, get Are your you... birdie. Get your birdie. <laughs> Step back and you just watch it. Oh! <laughs> Well, babe, you win, but I guess you're sort of used to that, aren't you? Huh? Well, most of the time. Hey, that was nice, a ball, nice wasn't it? Nice. Huh? I like that ball. You like the 17? Yeah. Hey, that was fun, babe. <laughs> it sure was, kid. Listen, speaking of kids, uh, yeah. did they bring out the little boy in you or something? You always oh, had a well, I, I'm really a kid at heart, you know. I guess that's because of all my years at St. Mary's down there, and I just got to love kids. Maybe I never grew up, but, you know, it's important that that, uh, that kids uh, make something for themselves. I mean, the youth, well, you know, I think it was that fellow Shaw that said it's a shame it's wasted on the young, you know, but it's, it's true. You know, I'd like to do everything I could for kids, and I think most of the adults, like fellas like ball players like you and me, we, I think we have a responsibility to the young kids. To sort of straighten them out the best we can to get the best deal out of life, you know. Well, you know, you used to run off to hospitals and see them quietly help well, people out, and, you know, you weren't a quiet man all the time, but you did some great things when it, when it came to kids. Uh, well, they're important, Tom. You know, they're really important. Remember the time at the big dinner? I remember when... Uh, oh, with the yeah. Uh, well, you see, at that time, I wasn't doing too good and uh, hitting not too bad at all. And so they had a big dinner there, so all the sports writers would come and ask me any question I'd answer straight. <laughs> well, Jimmy Walker was there. He wasn't mayor in New York then, but he asked me, he said, B, what are you going to do about all those kids out there that look up to you, you know? And I, it really touched me. So I straightened out. Hit 393 that year. 
You were the MVP and one of the very few unanimous choices. Yeah. You know? Listen, would you do me a favor? Watch that. Let's get to the ballpark. I'd like to see that Babe Ruth swing one more time for all those kids. All right, head uh, for it right away. All right, let's go. Babe, I guess the stadiums have really changed since you were hitting them out, huh? Everything changes, you know. Nothing stays the same. Fame, like so many other things in this world, passes away. All you really have left are just memories. See you, kid. See you, babe. Top speed is 150 miles per hour. It can reach a height of 15,000 feet in the sky. 